Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Yeah, you know, welcome to everyone who's, who's here and thank you for joining. Um, many of you are probably familiar with Elders Climate Action, for, but for anyone who is encountering us for the first time, we're a nationwide uh, movement of elders who are uh, focused on meeting the climate crisis um, for uh, ourselves and our families now, but for the good of our grandchildren and for coming uh, generations and for all life. Um, now this call is going to be an hour long presentation. Um, we're going to start with a fairly brief presentation, um, you know, presenting the material about methane that you've come to hear about, and then you'll have an opportunity for a Q&A. So please feel free to add questions in the chat. And then at the end, we're going to have a very important action we hope that all of you will take. Uh, we're delighted tonight uh, to have as our speaker, Solera Hughes, as the Moms Clean Air Force Program Manager for Campaigns, Solera Hughes works directly with key oil and gas states as well as on national legislation that will protect families from pollution and climate change. Solera started with Moms Clean Air Force in 2017 as a New Mexico field consultant. For five years, she worked to establish Moms Clean Air Force as a voice for parents around the state concerned with the health impacts of climate change. She worked with coalition groups to support Governor Michelle Lujan Gresham's call for nation leading state methane and ozone rules has testified numerous times at the Environmental Protection Agency, the Office of Management and Budget, and other federal agencies on issues including methane, clean car standards, toxic chemicals, and environmental justice. She was a panelist at the uh, EPA's uh, 2021 methane comment period training session for frontline communities a member of the National Methane Partners Campaign, and has facilitated meetings with parents and their elected officials to advocate for climate action, public health, clean energy, air quality regulations, and plastic reduction. And just as a reminder, after Solera's presentation is finished, we're gonna have a brief question period. And during that question period, uh, we're going to be joined by Grace Smith, who is an attorney at the Environmental Defense Fund is focused on reducing methane. So Solera, please take it from here. All right. Thank you all for having me. I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. So just give me a minute. All right. Great. Well, thank you all for having me today. Um, I am Solera Hughes, and I'm a project manager for Moms Clean Air Force. Uh, I work on our national oil and gas program, as well as our state climate campaign. And I live in Albuquerque, New Mexico with my 10 year old daughter. So I'm here today to talk to all of you about how cutting methane pollution is one of the greatest levers we have to quickly slow the impacts of climate change. Methane is a powerful greenhouse gas. Greenhouse gas pollution, which Moms Clean Air Force refers to as climate pollution, comes from five main categories or economic sectors transportation, electricity, uh, generation, industry, agriculture, and buildings, which can be commercial or residential. When we look at the amount of greenhouse gases that, we, that are produced or emitted, carbon dioxide is the largest by far, 79%, as you can see in this graph. The second largest greenhouse gas emitted is methane at 11%. But methane has more than 86 times the global warming effect of CO2 over a 20 year time frame. So this means that methane is a very potent greenhouse gas in the short term. We have here is a map of the area where there are deep deposits of oil and gas. So you may not know, but fossil fuels formed underground millions of years ago from prehistoric plants and other living things that were buried under layers of sediment and shell rocks. So that's what we consider fossil fuels. Methane leaks through the oil and gas supply chain. So I wanna ex uh, briefly explain what this means. Um, and it's important for when we talk about ways to cut methane pollution. Upstream is about extracting oil and gas from the ground and in the supporting infrastructure. So you can see that wells, compressors, facilities. Midstream is about storage and transporting oil and gas via pipeline, rail, truck, or ship. And downstream is about manufacturing, refining, petrochemicals, 
and selling on the market either to industry or to consumers. So you can think of things like gasoline, plastic, fertilizers, natural gas to your homes for heating and cooking. Um, and just a note that pipelines used throughout all segments to move oil and gas. The proposed EPA methane rule covers all oil and gas operations in the upstream segment and storage facilities in the midstream segment. So oil and gas operations release many different air pollutants throughout the entire process of this drilling, compressing, processing, storing, and transporting. And the EPA methane rule specifically addresses methane and volatile organic compounds. So what you see here is a flare that is not working well. So you see black smoke. Um, oil and gas companies use flares to burn off unwanted gas in emergencies and to avoid explosions. Um, these create a lot of harmful pollutants, but burning the gas is better than venting it directly into the atmosphere. So why do we care about methane pollution? Well, methane pollution is fueling the climate crisis and it directly impacts our health. Um, as a highly potent greenhouse gas that warms the planet 86 times more than carbon, this means that methane does a lot of damage to the climate in a very short period of time. So if we cut this pollution today, it can really make a difference. For reference, methane hangs out in the atmosphere for about 10 years, while carbon pollution hangs out in the atmosphere for 100 years. So cutting methane pollution could also improve air quality and public health. And where there are oil and gas operations, you can find methane leaking with these volatile organic compounds. Um, one of these that you might hear about is benzene. Right now, one in three people in the U.S. live in a county with oil and gas oil uh, production and are at risk for harmful oil and gas pollutants. So cutting methane pollution will have the benefit of reducing these associated harmful volatile organic compounds or VOCs like benzene um, because these gases commingle together. So the oil and gas industry is one of the largest sources of industrial methane pollution and oil and gas companies leak and vent methane into the atmosphere when they extract, store, transport oil and gas. Uh, methane is leaking from the oil and gas sector at the rate of more, more than 16 metric million metric tons a year. So that is the equivalent of the climate pollution from all of the nation's passenger vehicles in a year. Moms Clean Air Force partners in many organizations, such as Earthworks, to do our work. And Earthworks uses optical gas imaging cameras called a FLIR camera, which makes invisible air pollution visible. This helps the general public understand the oil and gas pollution problem and provides important information for nearby community. Uh, we have a short video here that shows how leaks can be detected using this technology and why it is so important for small wells to be included in the EPA rules. I was in this park working with some community partners and we smelled a really strong sulfuric odor as we were walking on one of the trails and using this camera I was able to see that there was a significant equipment problem at this well site. We saw that this piece right here was actually entirely missing that was allowing the methane gas and volatile organic compounds to pour into the air. So it was a real health hazard and it was also contributing to climate issues. So this is a small well with leak prone equipment. There are a lot of those across Pennsylvania. There's actually tens of thousands of these across the state. They account for 50% or more of the methane pollution from the oil and gas industry in Pennsylvania. Thousands of people visit this park every single year. And so it's very important that people who come here and children especially are not breathing in pollution. And if you guys hadn't stumbled upon this, would anyone have known that it was leaking? It's possible that no one would have known for a really long time. It definitely wasn't going to stop itself. So you can see in that video why it is so important for us to um, really have good regulations on leaking. Um, as we talk about these VOCs, uh, VOCs are an abundant component of shale gas population. And the primary example is benzene, which can worsen asthma, affect lung development in children, and imposes the risk of cancer, immune system damage, neurological, reproductive, and other developmental problems. VOCs also contribute to ground level ozone, which we often call smog. Um, when VOCs combine with 
nitrogen oxide in the presence of heat and sunlight. That's how we get ground level ozone. It's a potent air toxic that can stunt the growth of children's lungs and can damage every person's lung function, making it harder for adults with chronic lung diseases and children with asthma to breathe. MOMS has a wonderful fact sheet that talks about the health issues related to oil and gas pollution um, that you can see here, um, talking about how it impacts babies' health. Uh, there is increasing evidence that air pollution from the oil and gas industry can cause neurological problems, respiratory issues, asthma attacks, and cancer. And air pollution can increase the risk of adverse birth outcomes like low birth weight, preterm birth, and birth defects. So why are children especially vulnerable to air pollution? Um, most people inherently believe that adults in our society have this obligation to protect children um, who don't yet have a voice to speak for themselves. Um, children are especially vulnerable because they have a higher respiratory rate. So they breathe in more toxins per pound of body weight than adults do. Children also don't clear toxins from their bodies as efficiently as adults due to reasons related to growth and development. And children's brains and lungs are still developing until early adulthood. So this damage has uh, other consequences. In the United States, we have over 17 million people, including 4 million children under the age of 18, living within a mile of active oil and gas wells. And this puts their health at risk. Um, but the risk is not evenly distributed. Black, Indigenous, and Latino communities are disproportionately exposed to dirty air, including harmful pollution from oil and gas operations because of where they live, learn, work, and play. So prioritizing environmental justice and protecting frontline communities is imperative um, because they have historically shouldered an outsized burden of the impacts of air pollution and the climate crisis. Impacted communities, environmental justice leaders, and the general public uh, need to be frequently consulted and provide input to the design and implementation of methane protections. So we come to the EPA methane rule. Uh, last November, EPA announced an open in November of 2021 now. Um, they uh, And we had one comment period. And then last November, they announced another one um, that would last until February 13th, 2023. So uh, almost exactly a month from today. Um, and written comments will be accept accepted until that time. And the EPA public hearings were held uh, on January 10th, 11th, and 12th, uh, just a few weeks ago. This gives a unique opportunity for us to give that input about the rule and make our voices heard. So Moms Clean Air Force has always supported EPA's methane rule to cut methane and these harmful pollutants because we, we feel that it is an important step towards addressing the climate crisis and that it has significant health protections for our families. So what does the proposed EPA methane rule cover? Um, it covers new and existing sources of oil and gas operations. So the standards for the first time extend to the nearly 1 million older pre-existing oil and gas wells under federal oversight. These existing wells are built and modified after 2015 for 93% of the nation's wells and are responsible for the vast majority of the industry's methane problem. These uh, proposed rules also require the use of non-polluting equipment saying that basically we need to phase out equipment that is designed to release uh, pollution, such as pneumatic controllers and pumps, where zero emitting alternatives are available. EPA estimates that the transition to zero emitting pneumatic devices, as proposed, will decrease methane emissions by 19 million tons by 2035, the climate equivalent of taking over 300 million cars off the road for a year. The rule also ends routine venting and reduces flaring. So EPA's proposal would eliminate venting of associated gases from oil wells and require owners and operators to route the gas to a sale line where, uh, where that's available. Where that's not available, owners and operators would have to use the gas for power on site or for another useful purpose or route it to a flare or controlled device that reduces methane and VOCs by 95%. 
Research in the Permian Basin, which is around New Mexico and Texas, has shown nearly one in 10 flares either un, un, are either entirely unlit or malfunctioning. So they're venting methane directly into the atmosphere. Under this proposal, those operators will now need to show that they cannot use several other methods of gas capture before being allowed to flare. So we need to phase that out. We also need to phase out equipment that is designed to release pollution or vent where zero emitting alternatives are available. We also see in this rule a strengthening of methane monitoring. So the EPA is proposing to allow operators to survey sites using advanced methods already deployed by leaders in the industry, such as the um, aerial screening and the FLIR cameras that we saw Earthworks use in that video. Also increasing the focus on community participation. So EPA plans um, require that states identify underserved communities and seek their input during the regulatory process. Uh, they're also developing strategies that overcome linguistic and cultural barriers, promote sharing information with communities and soliciting input early in the process as these rules are implemented. So what improvements have been made? Um, we, as I said, we had the rule that was first released in November of 2021, and we, parents around the country and many, many people, almost half a million people gave testimony and asked for improvements. The EPA heard what we said, and they closed a loophole in the leak detection and repair standards by requiring routine inspections at all wells including those small wells in that video and including um, wells with um, equipment known to malfunction. That includes tanks and flares and uses gas imaging cameras. Um, also all low producing wells, which are responsible for half of all methane emissions will be required to routinely inspect for leaks. The intentionally polluting equipment. Oh, I'm sorry, I just went through. Whoop, past me. <laughs> went past one. The intentionally polluting equipment that I mentioned is also um, one of the areas that uh, they will be, they have fixed. And also a um, super emitter program that will um, look at large leaks. So then we come to the EPA comment period and why and how we testify. So the EPA regulatory um, process works by proposing a regulation um, the EPA considering public comments and issuing a rule and then codifying that regulation. So right now we're at step two on this chart. Public comment periods are um, required. Um, EPA is required by law to take and consider public comment so that we all have a chance to offer support and improvements to, pro uh, pr um, to propose regulations. So two ways to do this are doing during the oral public comment periods and um, the written comment. Um, since uh, we have had COVID, it has opened up the public hearings to be online um, virtual instead of in-person, allowing many, many more people to give public comment. And this is actually one of our organizer's daughters who gave public comment to the EPA um, a few different times. So whether you're giving public comment at a public hearing or in writing, the EPA wants to hear why rules are important. So if you're not comfortable sharing your story and um, writing something in depth about you, you can still make a difference by signing a petition that goes directly to the EPA docket. Um, one of our, we have a petition up at momscleanairforce.org slash petitions. Um, I think methane is the second petition on there right up at the top. Um, and so you can go and sign that. There's also the opportunity to edit and add in a few details about yourself in that petition, and that will be delivered directly to the EPA. So what's next? Uh, once the public comment period is over, what do we do and what happens? Well, after the EPA finalizes the rule, it will move to state implementation process. And states and tribes will have 18 months to submit their plans for EPA approval. So these plans are required to be equivalent to EPA on a source by source basis. And states may adopt strict uh, standards that are more stringent than EPA's as long as they don't violate state laws. Um, a few states do already have methane protections, like New Mexico and Colorado have very strong methane protections, so those states are already going to meet these EPA standards. Um, 
Also, we have the methane emissions reduction program. So this is part of the Infrastructure Reduction Act, or IRA, that passed in 2022. Um, and this establishes a fee that is paid by companies on methane that is flared, vented, or leaked during oil and gas operations. And this program complements the, the upcoming EPA methane rule, um, and it establishes fiscal consequences for states that hold off on passing a state implementation plan. So um, it penalizes them for the longer they wait. And it also, this, um, the acronym for this program is MERP, um, it also has 1.55 billion for methane programs, including methane emissions monitoring and um, funding that will protect communities. So I hope this gave you a good broad overview of the, uh, the new rule what you can do and why methane is essential um, for us to cut for the climate crisis. And I think we're gonna move now to Q&A. So I'm gonna be joined by my colleague, Grace Smith, um, to answer questions about how the role works and what we expect moving forward. And Grace is an attorney with the Environmental Defense Fund um, and focused on reducing methane. Uh, prior to coming to EDF, uh, Grace clerked at the Colorado Court of Appeals, the Center for International Environmental Law, Earth Justice, and the Hawaii Appleseed Center for Law and Economic Justice. She also just helped to um, write our comments uh, on the methane emission reduction program. So she is very well versed in all things uh, EPA and methane. So thank you, Grace, and thank you all for um, sticking with me through that presentation. Happy to answer any questions. Well, thanks Just for that very uh, informative and clear presentation. We've got some questions. Um, one question is, how do we assure that this work continues despite that fights in the fossil fuel industry and potential control by politicians opposed to the rules? I can take a crack at answering that. Oh, go ahead. Um, so there are a couple of things I'd say. The first is that when an agency passes a rule like EPA is about to do um, and a new administration comes in, which is definitely a possibility after, um, you know, in the next few years, hopefully not, but you never know. Um, in, in that case, an agency can't just change its position on, um, on what it had regulated previously without giving um, a reasoned explanation. Otherwise, a court can determine that the agency has acted what's called arbitrarily and capriciously. Um, and given the extensive and rigorous fact-finding um, and technical expertise that has gone into creating these proposed regulations and the final standards, it's going to be very difficult for a future EPA under a conservative administration to, um, to weaken those standards. The second thing I'll say is that there is um, what's called the Congressional Review Act um, resolution, which Congress um, allows Congress to rescind an agency's rule after 60 days um, of the rule being promulgated. So Congress has a deadline of 60 days. What that means in this EPA methane context is that um, EPA needs to finalize these standards uh, pretty soon. Um, and right now they're anticipating finalizing them by August, 2023. 60 days after that, Biden will still be, um, or the um, 60 days after that will still be, uh, the window will not have yet closed. So we are, good to go there, um, and the Congressional Review Act shouldn't be an issue for us. Okay. Thank you, Grace. And I'll just add to that that, um, you know, we did see methane repealed under the Congressional Review Act before, um, and it, it, there, there's always the opportunity through that process to continue to advocate and to um, find people that can um, help fight that. So it, it is it is something that you can continue to engage. Um, it doesn't just get swept away. There is still public um, participation in that. So it's very important to um, keep up to date on where the rule is um, throughout that process as well. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, are there things we can do at the state and local level to press for better state monitoring? 
Um, yes, I, I will just say getting involved um, and making sure that you are paying attention to what your what your state is doing as we move into the implementation process. Um, we have a lot of organizers that are very um, active at the state level that are continuing to make sure that they are reaching out to legislators, to regulators, to governors on the importance of passing strong methane protections. So um, as we move into state implementation, there'll be a lot of local um, actions that you can take and reaching out to local officials will continue to be very important. Mm -hmm. We had a question, how robust are the penalties for companies that violate the rules? Is this up to the states or is it specified to the national regs? Do you wanna talk about the um, MERP um, portion, portion of that, Grace? Yeah, so in EPA standards, um, if EPA finds a violation, it can take um, action through the courts to ensure that the operator is complying with the regulations. Um, when it comes to the existing sources that Solera discussed, all the new, the 1 million um, new sources that will now be covered under EPA's new regulation, those will be um, subject to uh, state implementation plans. New sources will be subject to direct EPA regulations. Um, so it will depend in part on how the state is implementing um, and enforcing the standards. If EPA finds that the state is not um, enforcing in a way that achieves reductions and in a way that aligns with EPA's proposed emission guidelines for existing sources, it can take follow-up action to ensure that the state is um, um, taking appropriate action um, and mitigating um, violations. And it's also my understanding that the longer states hold off on a state implementation plan, the larger the fees get. So there is a structure to incentivize um, having a, a state implementation plan in place sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. Got several people asking about uh, EPA and the Supreme Court you know, following what happened in uh, the West Virginia versus EPA case. Uh, are you concerned that similar things might happen to the methane rule? So I'll, I'll let Grace start on that, but I have some thoughts on that as well. Sure, thanks, Solera. Um, Yeah, our position is really that West Virginia EPA shouldn't have much of an impact um, or is not a great risk to EPA's methane regulations. And the reason for that is in West Virginia versus EPA, the court, the Supreme Court said that EPA was for the first time trying to um, implement regulations that would require generation shifting of an entire industry. Um, so in that case, EPA was requiring clean, um, power plants to use uh, renewable energy. Um, and in this instance, this is something that EPA has been doing for a long time, regulating oil and gas and VOC emissions, apologies for any background noise, um, from the oil from oil and gas facilities. Um, so this is something that is in EPA's wheelhouse and has been for a really long time. Um, and the, the courts you know, are unlikely to say that this is the type of regulation that was struck, um, that is similar to what was struck down in West Virginia versus EPA. And I can elaborate on more on that, but um, that's our general position. Great, thank yeah. you. And I'll just add to that. So the, the issue with methane is that we have solutions. We've had solutions for a while and these solutions are working. And in places like New Mexico and Colorado who have passed state plans, um, we have seen these, like the equipment is already available. Um, it is, it is you know, ready to use and it is easy and affordable in a lot of instances for um, industry to adopt. So um, is very much as, as Grace pointed out, unlike um, the power plant situation. But I'll also say that as, as we're talking about rules, we wanna just make sure that we are um, recognizing that the EPA's power is to reduce pollution and um, doing it with these easy changes like, you know, moving to uh, equipment that is zero emitting um, is something that is definitely a, that we can do and that um, people understand. So it is, we're seeing that on all levels um, that people are able to understand this and that it's available. Great. So, um, the states that produce the most methane are also the ones that have the most economic benefits from the fossil fuel industry. So can EPA 
monitor and make sure that those states actually enforce the rule. So, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, yeah, EPA can ensure that states are um, enforcing the rules under the 111D implementing regulations and um, the Clean Air Act um, statute, which allows EPA to ensure um, that although states are the, the um, primary mechanism for enforcement for existing sources, EPA has ultimate oversight to ensure states are um, enforcing properly. You know, uh, one of our questions asked, why uh, can't uh, methane be used rather than flared? Uh, and is anybody working on technologies to make that more feasible? Um, there definitely are ways that methane, uh, that natural gas can be used instead of flared. And that is one of the big things that we've been talking about in our comments to EPA and also in a um, uh, proposed regulations from the Bureau of Land Management. Uh, natural gas can be used um, by sending the gas through a pipe and sold for sale. It can be used by um, reinjecting the gas back into the ground. It can be used for um, other useful purposes on site at the oil and gas facilities um, that the operator owns. Um, and it can also be compressed um, natural gas that can then be trucked off and you and sold um, not through pipelines but but through trucking. So there are a bunch of ways for operators to capture their gas and use it for some meaningful purpose um, instead of flaring. And we've argued in our comments that that's not only feasible but extremely economical for operators. Mm -hmm. And I, I'll just say that there. Uh, um... You know, we, we talk about routine flaring. So right now flaring is routine for the industry and it should be an emergency procedure when you are looking at, um, at, at what's what's happening in the field. So I eliminating pollution from all pollution from routine flaring is a primary goal of an ask of the EPA right now. Mm -hmm. And one of our um, listeners uh, noticed that States can exempt wells if they determine that the well has no remaining useful life, but red states can exempt abandoned wells and lead producing wells under this provision. ECA has urged members to ask EPA to use its authority to establish a federal program under Section 112 to protect at risk urban communities from toxic air pollution. This would eliminate the opportunity for states to exempt wells. Do you support that proposal? Um, we need to read the question in the Q and A box to take a look at what the um, what you've said about the proposal. But I can speak to the remaining useful life provision a bit. Um, a lot of uh, the majority of sources covered by EPA's new reg regulation will be um, existing sites subject to state implementation plan process. Um, and under 111D and the state implementation plan prop process. Um, operators can ask for a variance or an exception from the proposed from the standards. Um, and to do that, they need to demonstrate that um, um, they need to demonstrate that they satisfy the remaining useful life and other factors um, variance provision. Um, so in that instance, uh, operators are allowed to show um, an unreasonable cost of control resulting from plant age physical impossibility or technical infeasibility um, or other factors that are relevant to the facility that make it such that they can't um, or would be very difficult to apply the, the baseline standard to them. Um, however, there are a few points to make on that. Um, some percentage of these sites have already been regulated by EPA since 2012 um, and for well sites since 2016. The second point is that there are mechanisms in the rule for um, a large source of emissions, pneumatic devices, um, and to pull them into coverage under the new source performance standards. And so in that case, those sources would not be covered by the existing source provisions and that remaining useful life variance uh, provision. Um, but finally, and most critically, I think, is 
the fact that there are limitations to the remaining useful life and other factors provision in the methane proposal. Um, so our understanding is that it will be very difficult for states to broadly grant exemptions from the standards based on what we call rule off. Um, for example, uh, EPA has proposed to allow states exemptions only when the facility doesn't have to make capital investments. Um, the leak detection and repair requirements do not require capital investments, so operators will not be able to ask for a rule off exemption um, for from the leak detection and re repair requirements, which are um, some of the most important standards in um, in, methane, in EPA's methane proposal. Um, there are some other guardrails as well, like um, EPA will not allow an exemption um, based on rule off um, or facilities age if it would have negative impacts to surrounding communities. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll just say that, um, that there are a lot of limitations on the rule off provision. I had a question about a particular uh, cogeneration plant in Linden, New Jersey, that has a lot of flaring. And the question was asking if you could comment on what can be done about that situation. So I am not familiar with that specific plant. Um, if it is something that falls under this rule, um, then that is definitely something that we want to see um, be reduced by this rule. If it is not, um, I know in certain areas that there is um, state or community monitoring um, that could help to, you know, at least address or um, keep records of that equipment. Um, and, and the flaring. One of the pieces of this rule that is important is the super emitter response program, which looks at large emissions incidents. And so, um, you know, that is uh, in designed to make sure that communities have a way to say there was a large emission and companies have to be responsive to that. So there will be some protections under this for, um, for a variety of different things. But, you know, we don't know the reasons for all of the flaring. Um, we do know that it's occurring too much. So hopefully there would be some remedies here that would be fall under this rule. To add on to that, um, the super emitter response program point that Solera just made in um, the methane emissions reduction program that was passed under the Inflation Reduction Act gives a lot of money to um, grants and loans to states, communities, and others for methane emissions and associated air pollution monitoring. Um, so in our comments that we recently submitted on how EPA should implement the methane emissions reduction program, we have recommended that EPA um, allow um, and uh, increase access for communities in the super emitter response program. So what that would mean is that communities um, such as the one uh, in the area that you're describing would be able to um, apply for a grant to EPA and um, monitor the situation going on there in that precise location. So that is something to look out for um, and EPA will be um, likely creating that grant program hopefully uh, in the next year or so. Okay, great. We have some other kind of related questions about methane. Uh, there's a, been a lot more attention recently about the health effects of methane gas uh, in homes, particularly uh, with gas stoves. And a uh, question was asking if you have any advice for homeowners about that. Um, I'll just say, you know, it is it is a an issue that I am I, I am deeply working in um, because I what I see um, in the methane gas issue is that um, we need to move away from fossil fuels and that includes um, the whole stream whether it's it's our homes or not but that is not something that everybody can do or afford to do right away so ensuring that people who have gas stoves in their homes have proper ventilation um, that they are aware of windows that they are being protected um, by tenant uh, laws or um, by ordinances as we start move seeing the IRA investments and electrification and homes, um, we'll start seeing a, a shift there. Um, but there are lots of things that people can do right now just to make sure that they are feeling safe. So make sure you're turning on those vents, opening those um, windows when you have your stove on. And um, you can also call to have the valves tightened. I think, you know, as we talked about leaks in, um, in, 
large production, um, that you also get leaks in your home. So making sure that valves are tight, that they are tightened regularly is really important for um, methane leaks in, in your home from your appliances. Okay. Also a question was asking about um, you know, more recent work on air pollution and the connection between that and problems that are other than respiratory problems. We hear mostly about asthma and other respiratory problems, but there are also neurologic problems and other issues. And uh, it's Moms Clean Air Force including those things in their educational work. Uh, we're still looking into some of these studies. Um, there's, there, you know, it's it, there hasn't been a lot of them until recently. So um, we're still looking at what these studies are uh, and the peer review. And we're very, we talk about it regularly and are trying to figure out what next steps we could have. Um, and hopefully we'll have more information um, on what's going on. And um, one of the issues with indoor air quality is there are a lot of sources. And so we just want to make sure um, that we are talking about the correct things and addressing all of the issues um, within somebody's home. But also that we don't want people scared in their homes. Um, we want to make sure that people feel safe in their homes. So um, having a list of things that they can do in the meantime um, is good and just making sure um, that you are you're paying attention. If you have a if you are thinking you might have a leak or you have an old stove, um, you know, you can look at a lot of organizations will come to your home and test for you. And so that might give you some peace of mind or um, some direction of what next steps are, are good for you and a good fit for your family. Great, thank you. We've been talking a lot about uh, methane from fossil fuels, which is obviously a huge problem, uh, but there are also a lot of agricultural sources uh, of methane, uh, particularly um, you know, uh, red meat and dairy. I was wondering if you had some thoughts about those. So we don't usually, um, we don't work too much with agricultural methane. Um, simply because um, it is not usually right next to homes in the same way that oil and gas operations are. Um, so I don't know if Grace has anything on that, but I, I know that there are a lot of people and a lot of our partners are working very um, heavily um, in this. And I think that includes um, the Environmental Defense Fund has a new methane satellite that is monitoring um, methane emissions um, globally, and that includes agriculture. So um, I don't know if you're, you've worked any deeper in that, Grace but if you have. I have to... not, um, but yes, EDF does also have um, a climate smart agriculture program um, and they are separately working on those issues. Um, and I think they will be working closely on the farm bill and ensuring that aspects of the farm bill um, incorporate climate smart ag practices that would reduce methane. Right. And um, another thing that uh, people were asking about is Moms Clean Air Force working to improve uh, climate education in schools. And some um, examples uh, questioner gave were you know, um, developing curricula that have uh, sort of citizen science project sorts of things to look at local pollution efforts, uh, maybe looking at how emissions change when we go from diesel school buses to electric buses as an example. Yeah, so we don't usually work directly with schools, but we have a ton of resources for teachers and educators on our website that have been developed over the years. Um, there's reading guides and a variety of those. I can try to find some of those um, to send you afterwards if somebody's interested. Um, please contact me. Um, and uh, that, that's definitely a piece of it. Some of our organizers do go into schools to work with them. Um, often what we like to do is we partner with organizations that are um, child-led and school-based. So we have partnered with a variety of different youth climate corps um, to help them with um, you know, just research, uh, activism, um, whether they're talking about their city council, what they want their school to do. Um, so those are all actions that we have supported and um, let that youth uh, climate movement, um, you know, really be able to move forward. I think I've covered what the questions in the chat, uh, but if I missed your question, you know, please uh, put it in again. If a new question just popped into your mind, uh, we have a few minutes. Um,
people were ask, also asking about uh, dietary changes, that certainly uh, agricultural changes are one of the things that, that we can do. But uh, any thoughts about uh, changes in people's uh, you know, personal uh, consumption habits? Uh, so I always say that that is something that is left up to individuals and is very, very important. I mean, we've seen this from the conversation of how important it is to recycle to, um, to what you put into your body. And um, that is always a piece of it. And we are all doing our part. But I will say that the when we look at what industry contributes to uh, these problems with methane and others, it is a solution that we know will make a huge difference um, for industry to curb back. So we cannot do it alone um, with all of our, um, you know, with all of our individual actions, those help, but they will not move us as far as we need to go. So making sure that we are covering all of our bases and looking at changes everywhere that we can make them is, is, is really important when we talk about the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. Another question we got is uh, about uh, methane leaks from landfills. And is that something that you're looking at? Is that something that EPA is looking at? So that is not something that I have worked on, but I will say I lived for many years in a city that had all of its public transit um, functioning off of methane from landfills. So there's a lot of work that's being done there that can be pretty amazing. Um, but uh, I don't know, Grace, if you've worked on this at all. Um, I think it is absolutely something. I think methane is an all of the above thing as far as the EPA and government is looking at all of these areas, but maybe you know a little bit more about that. Um, yeah, I haven't, I'm not directly working on this, but EDF, um, EPA issued a federal um, plan in May related to landfill methane standards, um, and um, EDF is going to be commenting on that. My colleague, Edwin Lemaire, is leading that effort, um, so I can't really comment on the details uh, or know much about it, but uh, we are involved in ensuring that those standards are are um, going to be strong. Oh, great. So um, there's a, a link to post in the chat about citizen science projects in methane. Uh, so if you're curious about that, uh, please take a look. And, um, you know, Solera and, and Grace, if you'd please uh, tell us a little bit more about next steps and what you think uh, people should be doing after this call. So the first thing I'd encourage you to do is to um, go, I think um, Ariana was going to put a link to our, uh, there's a, an article that talks about um, giving public comment and has a link to our petition. Um, I, that is a good um, place just to start, even if you don't send in our petition and you write your own comment to send to the docket, um, just look at that. Um, I think uh, Grace was also open to sharing um, the comment that that was submitted on behalf of EDF. And if you go to resources um, on the Moms Clean Air Force website, you can read testimonies that are written by numerous um, moms all over the country. And so I would suggest just, you know, thinking about submitting your own comment, um, either doing it the easy way or doing a little bit of research. And I'm happy to provide, um, you know, links to any of those things if you're looking for um, advice or just, um, you know, some other comments to look at as you're working on your own uh, comment. And then once the comment period's over and we move into implementation, just keep talking to your governors, to your state legislators, to your state regulators, departments of environmental protection, um, and making sure that these are moving forward and that you are continuing to make your voice heard. That is incredibly important. And would you remind us again about the uh, deadline for comments? The deadline for comments is February, February 13th, um, and it has not been extended, um, so that is the deadline. Okay, so do it before Valentine's Day. Yes, and we're trying to have over 500,000 comments this time, so please um, just make sure that you are, as, as you're putting in your comment, that you are letting your friends and family know that this is something they can do. Send them petition links. We're really trying to make sure that we um, continue momentum on this and that then we can then put pressure on the EPA to finalize quickly so we can move to that state implementation process um, as, as Grace was talking about. We're hoping to have this finalized by August of 2023. And having commented on some of these rules, it turned out to be a lot easier than I thought it would be. It sounds kind of daunting. They're going to tell the federal government how they should run their regulations, but it's really 
uh, not nearly as difficult as it might sound. And I'll just, uh, I, I just like to encourage people. It's um, one of the things that a lot I hear from a lot of people who are going to give public comment is that they aren't experts. They don't know numbers. They don't have statistics. They're not scientists. And that is good. Um, there are lots of scientists and experts who are giving testimony. What EPA um, wants to hear is from everybody. So they really, it is very important for you to tell your story and why climate change is important to you. Um, for a long time, I was very hesitant to give comments because a lot of the amazing, powerful super moms that I work with had these like heart-wrenching stories about living with oil and gas and their their children's health impacts. And I just didn't feel that my story was important enough. And um, the longer I've done this, the more I've realized that every person's story is important. If one person has a child who um, is suffering in any way, or you are feeling health or uh, impacts, even if your mental health is being impacted by concern about climate change, taking action and having that piece of hope is one of the best things you can do. And EPA weighs that, um, they, they, they weigh the number and they, they look at what people are saying. And the more people that are saying, this is important to me because it impacts me daily, even though I don't live maybe right next to oil and gas, I still care about it. That is very important and a very powerful statement to make. So don't feel like you need to be an expert, um, feel like you can tell your story and that, um, that there is a lot of value in that because there really is. And we have the links in the chat to make it easy to do that. Um, now, the public hearings on this have already passed, but there'll be other public hearings on other important rules. So, you know, um, Moms Clean Air Force has a great story about how those public hearings went and how people participated. Yes, and just as a little plug for uh, post-methane, we are also looking at um, a EPA comment period on particle pollution, which is, you know, um, another concern for um, air pollution and health. So you can find more information about that on our website at momscleanairforce.org as well. Um, and that will be the next thing that the EPA considers um, as this methane rule wraps up. And that, that particulate uh, pollution is extremely important. And we'll be telling you all more about that you know, as time goes on. Um, so this has been uh, really uh, very, very helpful. And I hope people will take the opportunity to make those comments uh, if they haven't already. That 13th of February may seem a long way away, but we have busy lives. And if we um, say, I'll do it tomorrow, it, it may um, get a kind of uh, put off too long. Um, so any last uh, questions or comments anyone has? I'd just like to add that if you fill out a petition and you submit and that is submitted to the docket and then you decide to write a longer comment, you can do that. That's I, I, I fill out petitions all the time as well as giving oral testimony. So um, you know, take that action today um, in case you know you don't have time down the road. Um, but you can always go back and submit comment again. Um, through uh, through the EPA website or other ways. So, um, you know, don't hesitate uh, if, if you can fill out a comment or fill out a petition, please add your name to those as well. Any talking points you uh, would particularly recommend? Um, as, as I said, you can go ahead and you can look at um, what is on our website. The big things that we're asking for here is for community participation, for the end of um, routine and pol eliminating pollution from routine flaring, and um, for, uh, for um, oh, my mind's going blank. What's the third one, Grace? <laughs> the third big ask. Um, ending routine flaring leak detection and repair um, improvements and um, retaining the zero emitting pneumatic yes. devices. Yes. We have, a, we can um, send you all our testimony that we has more detailed um, re re recommendations for the proposal. Absolutely. And I'm happy to share my testimony with anyone if you'd like to just read a mom's testimony. Great. That's, that's you know, super helpful and definitely, you know, it's hardest the first time you do it. So getting that to help people get started um, you know, can, is very, very helpful. So um, Solera uh, and Grace, thank you so much for this. Thank you everyone for coming. And please don't forget to mark your calendars for our next national call uh, in February. We're gonna be focused on the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, Cora Wyatt from Rewiring America will brief us on the, their savings calculator. 
and individual benefits we can uh, expect from the red, uh, legislation. Um, that's going to be a great benefit to the climate and also uh, for many of us, great uh, benefit to our families and our own pocketbooks. So we hope to see you all in February. Thank you.